Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to be with you today morning um, and hope will be a useful discussion, inshallah. Thank you, Dr. Ndasa. So let us start with the questions. Um, the, uh, please uh, send your questions in your Q&A section as well. We'll start with the first question. It's for Dr. Ndasa. What is the ideal timing for uh, postnatal ultrasound in antenatally diagnosed uh, pelvic aliceal dilatation? Uh, this kind of uh, the, uh, a very valid question, actually. The question is, is um, what's the timing of doing it postnatally? It, uh, it's always related to what was detected antenatally. Because if we have a scenario of um, a male of, um, with a severe uh, bilateral hydronephrosis and oligohydrominus, then the diagnosis is most likely a posterior trial You need to do it immediately after birth. Um, because that would affect your management and your timing of your intervention, which will definitely affect your outcome. While if I have a unilateral mild hydronephrosis, which was more or less stable throughout the pregnancy from the uh, antenatally anomaly scans till the end of the pregnancy with no affected affection of the amniotic fluid volume, then uh, waiting till a week at least of life will be more reasonable. Why? Because these patients most likely will have just a simple uh, congenital hydronephrosis with no structural blockage or an abnormality in the urinary tract causing it. So waiting for the child to lose the extra fluid, let's say, in the first week and then gaining and then going back to the normal urine output in the first month of life will be more reasonable to um, get more um, value or reliable, let's say, results on um, detecting if there is any real hydronephrosis or not. Because doing it very early, like I get a lot of referrals of uh, babies uh, did the ultrasound on day one. And then when I repeat, when I see at one month of age, it's increased from that day one. That doesn't mean it's it really increased, most likely because it was done very early on in life. And that was a fake reassurance for the pediatrician who did the ultrasound or the radiologist, and that affected or delayed some management even for the patient. So the timing, depending on the what was the finding antenatally, um, that, that's very um, con connected to the where, when we should do it postnatally. Sure, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Sharma. We had a 34-week uh, preterm with the uh, posterior urethral valve. Um, uh, and, sh and she's asked about uh, the management uh, um, uh, of. So I think what she is meaning is the she was trying to explore into the management of posterior urethral valve, especially with uh, challenging situations like uh, preterm babies. Okay, shall I start? Uh... Please, yeah. Yeah, sure. So for the 34 weeker, again, uh, or any, any baby of any gestational age, it depends uh, very much on the weight of the child for the surgical part, which I will leave for Dr. Amar. For the medical part, which I would recommend if we suspect, as I as just uh, mentioned, if we have a male baby with a bilateral hydronephrosis, always, always re rule out posterior third part because your early management will make a big difference in this child's life. So when the baby is born, you will put a urinary catheter and you have to be careful when putting the urinary catheter, do not force it. Uh, it's very important because if it is, it depends on how much blockage is there. So you might be having some difficulty, but it was, it was very difficult. It's safer to do a vasectomy for this child than um, and put a supra pubic kind of catheter or a bladder catheter, I mean, in regards of, uh, instead of doing a urinary catheter. Uh, because you might cause more damage if you force the catheter. Uh, always go for a smaller size catheter, uh, urinary catheter, or even NG tube feed. You, your idea is to bypass the blockage and reduce the pressure on the kidneys and then get the urine output going on. Uh, the posterior of all babies are very variable in regards of how much renal damage would happen during the pregnancy. Some of them will go into uh, the water sequence, and they will be really um, high oligohydrominous with lung hypoplasia, and they won't survive. And some of them will be messed up till their teenager years. So they have a huge range of serial survival babies of how they would present, and how severe they are, would they have renal impairment, would they require dialysis at birth or not. So stepwise, you will. This baby is a 34 weeker. Um, it depends again back to the weight 
on the surgical intervention, but immediately you will need to insert an urinary catheter because that's your vital part of the management of those babies. Uh, checking the creatinine and the electrolytes at day one usually is not very reliable. We know that because it's most likely a maternal result, but it won't harm. So you will have your baseline to see where you are heading in the next few days. Measuring your intake and output, do not limit the intake. Actually, those baby, after you put the catheter, they will be bulyuric because you are bypassing the obstruction. And it's very well known that those baby who have an obstructive uropathy, when you relieve the obstruction, either by your catheter and later on by your surgery, they will go into a bulyuric phase. So restricting the fluid is not a good idea. They are not oligouric uh, renal failure unless they have a total shutdown. So during catheter, putting prophylactic antibiotic, most those baby will go to the NICU as a premature will be on antibiotics, which should cover enough. So you don't need to add extra prophylactic antibiotic. Checking your electrolytes at day one as a baseline, but keep in mind it might be maternal, doing it after a couple of days and you will go from there. Um, and then the surgical part, it depends much on the size of the baby because you need a proper instrument to do it, which I will leave to Dr. Amar to elaborate more, I think, on it. Uh, it is for Dr. Entesar. Is the antibiotic prophylaxis uh, indicated in all cases of uh, antenatal renal pelvis dilatation? Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of studies had looked at this and uh, looked at the long-term outcome of giving prophylactic antibiotic. It used to be years ago that everybody with a moderate to severe hydronephrosis and um, that's a different discussion by itself, what is severe and moderate, of to give prophylactic antibiotic. Uh, but <clears throat> not anymore. And then that's a big, uh, usually a kind of a, a debate between us and the surgeon of whom to give prophylactic antibiotic and who not. And I, I'm kind of keen more toward the <clears throat> surgeon practice of not to give to everybody prophylactic antibiotic. Again, it depends on, we have the privilege now of having the detailed antenatal scan. So usually that scan will give us a lot of information of what's possibly that could be. Um, of antenatally. And then, as you just stated, preparing the parents of what to expect uh, in the after delivery. And that make it even easier to deal with the family and their, you know, instead of just diagnosing it after birth or even later on in the infancy and having this shock status and denial and all the issues, preparing them antenatally and going through that is usually a very valuable point in managing those patients. Now back to the prophylactic. So prophylactic antibiotic, Unless it's a reflux, there is no point of putting giving prophylactic. But you don't know if it is a reflux or not at birth, right? But you will have a hint of it. So if you have a unilateral moderate to severe hydronephrosis, usually it's an indication to keep them because we know that if they develop UTI, they can go into urosepsis easily in the first three months of life. So all pediatrician or all neonatologists need to be very careful for any baby with a moderate to severe hydronephrosis in the first three months of life. I'll give you an example. Last week, I got a referral in Zaleha in the clinic with a patient. <clears throat> she's, a, a, she's a female with a bilateral hydronephrosis. And the renal pelvis measurement on one side was 20 millimeter, on the other side was 2.4, uh, 24 millimeter. It's quite high, uh, dilated. And the ultrasound was done on day one, right? Again, back to the day one and the timing. And uh, so when I repeated the ultrasound, the, and the baby was sent to me, she was six days of age. She's a female, uh, fine, she's not BUV, but she might be still reflux because it's very uncommon to have a bilateral BUJ junction obstruction, built uretic junction obstruction. So this baby came to me with no antibiotic. So first thing I said to the family, this is most likely a reflux. Second will be a bilateral BUJ, which is not very common, but I'll put her on prophylactic. The plan was to do um, the MCG and the nuclear scan based on what we will find, either we'll proceed with that or not. So when you have, and I repeated the ultrasound at one week of age and it showed by, and it showed hydroureter along with the hydronephrosis. So that mean if you have a hydroureter, then it was, it was I mean, and maybe I'll update you later if it is a, a reflux or not. But the, this baby, when I repeated the ultrasound at day at, at one week of age, when I start seeing her, she had hydroureter. So a hydroureter with hydronephrosis could have most likely it's a reflux. We'll wait for the MCG next week. But 
um, again, prophylactic, if you have any suspicion of a reflux, definitely you will put it. If you have a hydronephrosis and hydroureter, definitely. And if you have a hydronephrosis moderate to severe, even if it's unilateral, it's worth putting the prophylactic antibiotic till you finish your workup for these babies. Some families will be against giving any prophylactic antibiotic and want to wait, but we explain to them and we document that risk of infection with elaborating to your or, or escalating to urosepsis is there for those babies. So they need to know that there is a risk of urosepsis. And even, you know, we've seen cases of urosepsis and then meningitis and the child becomes CP because of all of this. It's not common, but it might happen. So why to take the risk? When you explain to them the risk, usually they will accept the antibiotic, but some of them won't. But if I'm planning for MCEG, definitely I will give prophylactic antibiotic. And this is very important. So um, again, I've seen some cases coming to me with MCEG done, never put prophylactic. So if you put the, if you think of reflux, safer to start prophylactic antibiotic. But if we have a mild hydronephrosis, unilateral or even bilateral, no hydroureter, there is no, no, um, no evidence supporting that prophylactic antibiotic would help in those cases. I think you are muted, Dr. Debo. We can't hear you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ndesa. Uh, we will try Dr. Uh, uh, Omar once more. Um, so uh, we were asking about the, the, we were discussing about the posterior urethral valve. Uh, so about the surgical management and the challenges, especially in a, in a, in a, in a late preterm baby. Now it's okay. <laughs> Sorry for this technical issue. Uh, good morning, everybody. Regarding the um, serious valve, as the doctor and Sar said, that uh, our aim at the beginning to uh, drain the uh, evacuate the bladder, which is uh, distended, which uh, lead to uh, reduce the uh, back uh, the intravesical pressure and reduce in uh, in this area in this uh, way to reduce the back pressure to the kidney. So now we uh, our aim to release the obstruction by putting urethral catheter. After that, we have to wait until the baby, because most of them will be preterm. We have to wait until he getting weight and uh, stabilize the renal function and the pulmonary status to be recovered from his uh, pulmonary uh, uh, issue. So uh, there is no cut off uh, regarding the uh, the weight of the baby, but we prefer to be uh, more than three kilogram. Uh, uh, we have to wait around seven to 10 days after uh, birth because we need to know his renal function. As you know, uh, on birth, uh, after birth, he will develop, uh, the uh, creatine will be a little bit normalized because he depends on placenta uh, uh, blood uh, clearance. Uh, by time, every day, the creatine will increase uh, and will be stabilized between uh, day seven, day 10. At that time, we can know the baseline of his renal function. We can take him to OT. By this seven to 10 days, we have to do some uh, sequence dilatation of the urethra because the caliber in units, special britain is very uh, narrow. So we can start as Dr. Antasar said with five French uh, feeding tube. Uh, then we can increase every three days. We can increase six, eight, sometimes reaching 10. Uh, this problem nowadays with the new technology of uh, fiber op uh, optic and uh, the caliber of the uh, cystoscope is uh, changed. Uh, I think I have video if they can uh, make it on now. Uh, hey, show yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the receptoscope which used around uh, 8.5 uh, French, but nowadays there's new scopes 3 or 4.5 French. The problem with the scope is very flexible, so you cannot aim the target to destroy the leaflet of the bar. But it's still working, or we can wait 10 days with the sequence dilatation. Uh, to destroy our our aim in surgery, uh, we have to assess all uh, the bladder, uh, prostate, uh, and the uh, valve. As you know, there are three types nowadays. They say two types only of prostatal valve. We have to destroy the leaflet completely because there's a chance to uh, leaflet to join again, make recurrence. Uh, so we'll assess the bladder if he has uh, most likely the baby has a hyper. Uh, uh, Trabeculation of bladder, saccus, diverticular, 
we assess the both the uteric orifice, if, uh, the shape and the location uh, to see the degree, uh, because uh, to see if the uh, reflux will uh, heal after removing the obstruction or not. Blood and neck most likely will be hypertrophied, prosthetic urethra will be dilated, and you'll see the virumentum and uh, uh, follow the leaflet of the valve to uh, fulgurate. Uh, technique, uh, surgery technique, we have a lot of uh, technique, either with cold knife, only like knife will cut the uh, leaflet until it reach the uh, urethral uh, mucosa. Uh, we can do with the electricity, uh, either with the loop or with the hook, with bugby. And nowadays we can do, use it with laser, but laser is difficult to uh, hook or uh, engage the leaflet. So better with, uh, with hook more than uh, laser. So we're going to play the video now. Uh, okay. I, I want to uh, comment uh, during video but to uh, gain weight more. So in this video, uh, we are using the, uh, uh, the cold knife, only knife to cut. So uh, this is the area of uh, valve, this uh, right leaflet. So uh, it's easy and uh, only membrane, so no uh, significant blood uh, flow, only uh, cutting this leaflet. The valve uh, from its name is making uh, the mechanism as uh, one way direction. So when we are going inside the bladder, you cannot see, notice the, the valve because the blood uh, the irrigation uh, makes uh, flat, it's compressed. So, uh, we have to go back, fill the bladder and go back, open the, uh, close the irrigation, open the outer flow and press over the lower abdomen. So the leaflet will, uh, be, uh, the leaflet will be filled with urine, it will appear. So this we cut on the five and seven o'clock, plus minus 12 o'clock. If not opened well, we have to cut at 12 o'clock. This is seven o'clock and five cut and so this cold knife will not go through all the, the video because the same uh, principle but uh, with different uh, uh, technique, different mechanism. Sure. This is the 12 o'clock and uh, after that the flow will be uh, on table. We can see the, the flow good on table, not intermittency. I think enough we do now. Thank you. The next question is um, uh, for Dr. Intasa. Uh, what is the outcome in uh, uh, PUJ obstruction and uh, how frequently should we monitor in such cases? Okay, so if you, uh, first you would need to diagnose it. Uh, so those babies, again, most likely would have a unilateral moderate to severe hydroenthosis, and usually it's picked antenatally. What happened that postnatally around a week or so, we, re we repeat the scan uh, when the baby has a good urine output at that time. And then we look at the degree of the hydroenthosis and the degree of the cortical thinning. Because in PGA junction obstruction, there will be a, a fast increase or um, and, uh, like let's say a fast incre uh, in uh, increment of increasing uh, renal bilbus for those babies. And usually you will have a normal ureter caliper because the blockage is before the beginning of the ureters, right? At the junction between the renal bilbus and the upper end of the ureter. So usually the, the renal bilbus is more of a balloon-like and usually the cortical uh, thickness is reduced because it did affect that kidney or, during the pregnancy. So those babies, we uh, urgently in the first month of life, we do for them the uh, nuclear scan. So there's the different ways of doing it or different, <clears throat> let's say, material to be used. Uh, usually we uh, use the basics up, along with the nuclear scan. Uh, and then that will diagnose how bad is the blockage because not all BEJ will require surgical intervention. Again, this is also an extreme like the UV. So in BEJ junction obstruction, the BEJ junction obstruction, um, some babies are born with uh, a ruptured urinary renal bilbus and they will have urinary ascites. We've seen that. And some of them are missed up till age of four or five and will be found on, a, on an incidental uh, ultrasound or just a coincidental, let's say ultrasound was done for other reasons. 
um, because usually, especially in the newborn, as we know, it's painless. We, we don't know for sure. But in older kids, it suddenly happened because of the blockage is usually painful. Um, and the, the thing with that, again, back to the how, how frequent you do it, again, it depends on it. So we, in those babies, if we are suspecting BGF obstruction, which again, as I said, ballooning of the, uh, of the renal belfast, thinning of the cortex, we immediately in the first month of life itself, we will do the nuclear scan. And then will come the surgical management of when to do the surgical. It depends how bad is the blockage. And I leave it to Dr. Amar of what option of doing, because then approaching those patients surgically have multiple options, either on what to do surgically and the timing of it. Um, so, uh, but it depends if it is severe, my, let's say my medical part, if it is severe, I will always refer them early to the surgery. If this baby landed with me, some of them will land from, with the surgeon from the beginning. Um, and to, the idea is to preserve that kidney function because the earlier relief, if it was severe blockage, the earlier relief, the blockage, the more chances you will preserve that kidney function long term. I think Dr. Amar can comment on the surgical part. And then uh, just one point is the frequency of the ultrasound. So frequency of the ultrasound, again, if, if we decide at the beginning that the surgery is not required now, um, in the first two years of life, we are very keen to do it not more than every three months. Some of them will require even more frequent ultrasound just to see the monitoring of the, um, uh, monitoring of the dilatation of the renal pelvis. Dr. Omar, please. The surgical options. Yes, uh, we'll go through the history of uh, uterine pelvic junction. In early uh, 20th century, uh, there was studies showed that uh, around 25 of 25% uh, of patient who has diagnosed as uh, uterine pelvic junction, they have deterioration in uh, renal function. For this reason, they uh, they uh, mentioned that all patient uh, diagnoses they have to uh, underwent uh, to go for surgery. Because uh, at that time, there is lack of uh, some studies like uh, scintigraphy, uh, renal scan. Uh, nowadays, with the renal scan, we can decide which one has real obstruction or partial obstruction. Partial obstruction, we can observe. But real obstruction is uh, better to uh, operate directly to recover the renal function. Uh, before, there was uh, like uh, the trend not to, uh, not to uh, operate patient below one year. But nowadays, no. Whenever you have... Uh, them says, uh, DTBA or uh, diuretic uh, isotope showed uh, uh, real obstruction, it's better to operate even if it's infant, no problem. So uh, regarding the technique, uh, on around 1943, there's uh, one Dr. Davis principle. He, he wants to do a cut of the area of the uh, uh, structure and put uh, stent only uh, and they heal the, the fat until reaching the fat. The fat will heal the area, and but the success rate is very low. Uh, on 1949, uh, Anderson Heinz technique, he uh, described the technique uh, to dismember uh, bioplasty, cut the area, complete the area of obstruction, cut it, and three anastomosis after making spatula and diuretic. Uh, till now, this is the gold standard technique, uh, uh, either to do it uh, open or laparoscopy robotic with high success rate, 99% success rate, Anderson Heinz. After that, with the development of the ureteroscope, uh, around 1980, then uh, the uh, 1980, then 1986, they make integrated uh, 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 tummy or uh, retrograde bilotomy. Uh, now uh, done with laser, but till now the success rate is around 80 to 85, not too much. So uh, till now, uh, robotic uh, laparoscopy cam came uh, uh, in 1993 and robotic 19, uh, 2002 for the uh, bioblasty uh, with the good success rate. But till now, the open uh, reaching 99%. Um, also, the, our aim to uh, cut the area of uh, uh, structure and re um, According to uh, Prophylaxis, uh, here, uh, we, until doing the operation, we have to give a prophylaxis because uh, either bilateral uh, uh, moderate hydrophilus or uh, unilateral severe, this our uh, from our part to give uh, prophylaxis. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, this is an add-on question from uh, Dr. Nasma from what uh, Dr. Intisar has discussed before on antibiotic prophylaxis. The question is about uh, the choice, the preference, the choice of antibiotic. This is for, uh, for Dr. Intisar. So the choice of, uh, one point I wanted to add on Dr. Otam, what Dr. Amar said that the, not all the junction obstruction will require surgery. Um, so majority actually will not require surgery and it will improve by itself. But from the nuclear scan, as we both kind of agreed, it will help us a lot to decide on who will require surgery and who's not. So now on the choice of the antibiotic, the choice of the antibiotic, don't go broad. That's very important because you don't want to develop resistance. So don't go cephalosporins from the beginning, okay? Um, start with amoxil or trimethoprim are usually a good choice. So I would put them on one. It depends on the availability because not all hospital will have trimethoprim syrup. Uh, it's available in some, because you don't want to give the combination, right? The septrim, because that then will affect the, um, the liver and we know the joint is risk and all. So if you have trimethoprim, it's usually the best choice to start. Uh, second will be amoxil. Don't go very strong with antibiotics because you don't want this baby from the beginning to suffer from side effect and develop a resistant organism because those baby will be on one or two years antibiotics. So, um, and you will need to do a switch and then you will uh, become, uh, you will face ESBL. You will be doing it by giving those antibiotics. So you have to be careful in choosing the antibiotic. So I would limit it only to trimethoprim or amoxy. I usually do not exceed more than this in the first three months of life, unless if I have a proven UTI with a proven uh, sensitivity, which I will base like a proven uh, infection with the sensitivity from the baby, baby himself or herself. And based on it, I will choose my uh, prophylactic antibiotic if I will need to do a switch from those basic two ones. Dr. Amar? From our side, we prefer the nitrofurantine, but not available here in all the hospitals, maybe only in government. Uh, after yeah. two months, uh, age of two months, we can start on nitrofurantine. But as you mentioned, uh, the available here, amoxicillin or uh, Yeah, and nitrofurantine, you are right, it's a very good choice, but again, not at birth. So at birth, I would stick only to these two. Yeah. Sure. Um, the question is from Dr. Suwas. Uh, when can we suspect renal scarring in neonates? What modalities is best for uh, neonates? He was uh, mentioning about the uh, evaluation for uh, uh, the psychoureteric reflexes. Okay, so the, the timing of the, so if we, if we have an infection, regardless what was the reason, most likely it will be a reflux. Um, then uh, a chance of scars is there. Um, now, evaluating the, the scar never done in neonatal part, in neonatal age, because it's way too early to decide on it. Um, because scar, by definition, is that a non-functioning kidney part, right? And usually it happened at the either upper or lower pool, at the borders of the kidneys, the scar. It depends how bad was the infection. So usually the we're evaluating for a scar happen after a urinary tract infection. So common scenario that I will get a four month, six month old a baby who had a, a UTI or a one year old who have a recurrent UTI, but it was missed. Then an ultrasound was done antenatally, nothing was there because not always in reflux, it's important to remember, not always in reflux, you will have an abnormal antenatal or even postnatal scan. You can have a normal, scan because reflux has graded. So it depends how bad is the reflux, then you will start getting the hydronephrosis and the hydroureter. But not all reflux, you will have abnormal scan. So if you have a UTI in a child who is below one year of age, a recurrent UTI especially, requiring admission, requiring IV antibiotic, this is most likely a reflux, even if you have a normal scan. Because remember, an ultrasound scan is very much operator dependent. So you might be labeled as normal, but you're not normal. Um, so then those patients, usually what we will do, we'll put them prophylactic, proceed with the MCG, and then see if there is reflux. Now about the scarring. After the urine infection, you have to wait. Because if you do it early on, it will detect the area of pyrurephritis, and it will, will, not, it will mask the area of the, the scar. So you won't be, it won't answer your question of the, does this patient or this baby has scar or not? So you have to wait. You have to wait at least a month or more uh, to do your renal scarring. And remember, the, when you order anything, you should think of 
how that would affect my acute management or long-term management or even counseling my patient. So if that won't affect much, I would wait. The more you wait, the better. Before it used to be, you have to wait three to four months, but that's way too long. After a month or so, so one month to six weeks, eight weeks, you can do your beginner scar, which is a, new, a special nuclear scan for DMSA scan. So DMSA scan will tell you the renal perfusion on both sides. It will give you the function, the split function of both sides. And then it will tell you if there is any filling defect, which is the scar. Because as I said, the scar is a non-functioning kidney tissue. So then it will detect for you the extent of the scar. Um, and in those patients, most likely, if you go back to the, if they have a big scar, if you go back to your ultrasound, which is labeled as normal, you will see a difference in the size of the kidney, which has the scar, which usually will be smaller, and the other kidney, which usually will be a bit bigger, even by one centimeter or half centimeter difference in the renal length. Dr. Amar, you want to add anything on the scarring part? I uh, totally agree with you that we have to wait after uh, after clear infection around one month because uh, uh, the uptake will be ha hazy because he has bionephritis febrile UTI. So we cannot uh, see the, uh, the scar by uh, itself. Definitely after birth, we cannot do it. We can do after uh, the initial uh, uh, febrile UTI, one month. Then uh, this is as base baseline. Later on for the decision if you need uh, operation or uh, intervention or not. If the uh, scars number increase, uh, this is also a clear indication for intervention. And then remember <laughs> reflux not always require surgical intervention. Majority of reflux cases will regress by itself. Yes. Uh, but, and then the timing of the surgical intervention, which Dr. Amar can comment, is different. Because if I have a child who have a single kidney with grade 5 reflux, most likely this child will require earlier because I want to save that kidney as much as possible. And usually you propose to the family and we do a nuclear scan to determine the function because you don't wait for the increasing creatinine. That would be way too late to do intervention. Better to do it earlier on. And now with the with the current era of having all the nuclear scan and the imaging and the new techniques and surgical of what to do for those patients, it's um, always, you have it. so the decision to do surgery for reflux or not is very uh, variable among on the patient. So I have a single kidney child um, who already have multiple scar, definitely I would re uh, refer to the surgeon for early intervention compared with a child with two kidneys and grade Three, let's say, reflux on one side. Definitely, I would wait on this child because it will usually regress by itself. Sure, thank you. Uh, the next question is about uh, uh, the, the 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 kids who have missed a detection in the antenatal scan. So it is the question is what are the early signs that can raise suspicion in uh, congenital renal tract anomalies in the pediatric population? Dr. Ntasar, please. Can you repeat the question? Sorry, I didn't get all. Uh, for uh, those babies who were missed on the antenatal scans, mm -hmm. uh, so if if they didn't have a scan in the neonatal period because it was not picked up, uh, as a pediatrician, as a as a clinician, are there any hints which can uh, help us look into that side of things? That's all the textbook of nephrology, but fine, I'll try to <laughs> summarize. So. Um, Usually the common ones, like, because you want to pick the one which you can fix, right? So the BEJ junction obstruction and the reflux, those are the common ones. BUV, if it is missed, and I've seen cases missed in the oldest I've seen missed BUV was a 14 year old boy, unfortunately, and it came with end stage renal disease. Um, but uh, the, the things, the hence you will get, urine infection will be your red flag, because again, pain is not very common. Uh, as a, or let's say pain, abdominal pain is very common in pediatrics, right? So it's not always will give you, this is a BJ obstruction or this is something else in the renal uh, abnormality in the structure of the urinary tract. Um, or incidental, and usually those patients will have an, just an ultra abdominal ultrasound to rule out any structural abnormality in the abdomen. And then we, they will pick it up as a pediatrician. But now for the answer to kind of summarize, Antenatally, usually there. If it is not there and the child is well, um, the m most likely reason will we will pick up or the hence for the pediatrician is urine tract infection. 
because if you have a structural abnormality, you have a higher chance of having a refractive infection. Um, pain, hematuria, that's again very minor or small number of patients which will be initial presentation and then leading to the ultrasound, which usually the pediatrician will do before referring to us. But most likely your infect infection will be the hint. So if you have an infection, and I've seen uh, another example last this week, I've seen a, uh, she's, she was eight year old girl who um, was referred to me as proteinuria because of suspected FMF and amyloidosis. Like, sorry, but it didn't make sense. So what we, uh, when I digged in the history, she had a recurrent UTI, did MCG, and it was a grade three reflux on one side. And scars when we did the nuclear scan. So, you know, the because the presentation is abdominal pain and fever, right? And deterioration origin, uh, most, and they could not find the reason. Then FMF was, she was labeled and started on colchicine. I know that extreme. And then she was reflux. She was reflux, we put a prophylactic antibiotic, discuss with the rheumatologist, start cleaning up the colchicine. And so if, a pro, remember as a pediatrician, I know I'm saying basic things. History is very, very important to, to lead you toward what? Because abdominal fever is like what? 99% of the complaint we get in the clinic. Yes, totally agree. And uh, sometimes we forget to stick to our basics in uh, some yeah. cases. Thank you. I think we have uh, time to take one last question. Um, how frequently do you follow up infants with uh, multicystic uh, dysplastic kidney? What is their uh, long-term outcome? How do we counsel the parents? Okay, so this is again one of the common things we see. <clears throat> so we, we have an antenatal scan detected one kidney with a multiple cyst. Uh, remember, if it is bilateral cyst, you should think of polycystic kidney disease, but we will go to the more common one, which is multicystic dysplastic kidney. So in those babies, if it's a unilateral, the trend surgically, and Dr. Amar can comment on that, was to remove all these kidneys. That was years ago. Any cystic kidney, they think it's higher chance of having tumors, let's just take it out. Uh, but then when they looked at the uh, histology or the pathology reports or all these kidneys, um, they have the normal incidence of having tumors compared to other kids, no matter the timing you did it. So now the trend is not to touch that kidney and follow it up with scan. The indication for surgical intervention is if the kidney is getting bigger than smaller, so then the risk of tumor is there. Keeping in mind, they are not at higher risk of developing worms or any other kind of tumor. But if it happened, like in the, my last 20 years of experience, I've seen one child who developed worms in that kidney. So um, again, people had looked at that and looked how much they will uh, have uh, risk or do they have increased risk of tumor or not? The answer is no. The second, if the child developed hypertension, and the um, bathophysiology behind that, that the child, when they have an abnormal kidney with an abnormal tissue, the renal artery blood flow goes to the kidney, but then has some resistance inside the kidney. It triggers the renal angiotensin system to go up and then to increase the flow to that kidney, and then hypertension will happen. And usually it happens in the first year of life. Um, and when this kidney starts regressing, it disappears. But we usually put them on antihypertensive in the first one year or so of life to prevent damage from the high blood pressure to the other normal kidney. Second, infection. Again, they are not at higher chance of developing infection, but if they uh, develop an infection, it will be difficult to eradicate in that kidney. And it might affect the other kidney. And if he's too young, you can develop urosepsis. And if the child having, so the increasing, uh, the size having urinary tract infection or having hypertension might be an indication for nephrectomy for those child. Now, how we uh, follow them up, those kidneys, we do uh, in the first, usually toward the end of the first year of life. So first year of life, every three months, we follow them with ultrasound to see if it's not increasing. At the end of one year, when they are bigger, we do nuclear scan to look at the function of that kidney. And uh, it depends on the function of the kidney. If it has any, creating any problem, which I mentioned just now, then we take, go in and refer them to the surgery and then advise them to take it out. If it is not, we again, continue following them. 
uh, and because it's an abnormal formed tissue, even if it doesn't have any function, it's still at risk of worms tumor. So we follow them in more closely in the first two to four years of life. In the first two years of life, usually three uh, every three months and then every six months. After four years of life, four to five, the risk of worms tumor is not there. So we don't re really need to follow them more than six months or even every year. After that, at around six, I, I don't need to follow them anymore, to be honest, especially if it vanished, the kidney. For multi-cystic kidney, we prefer to do MCUG for patients because there's a chance to have a contralateral VUR, 10 yes. to 20% of patients. Uh, also, I saw one patient with the same kidney because the, the aim of multi-cystic kidney, the, uh, the connection between the uteric bud and the mesonephric is not joining together. So uh, might have also on the same side a reflux. But uh, usually we have it to, to rule out the contralateral uh, VUR. Yes. And for surgical uh, removal, as you mentioned, if the patient has a uh, hypertension or uh, a large uh, multi, uh, the kidney is large, uh, or, uh, also if patient uh, prepared, other patient prepared for transplant, if he has multicystic or polycystic uh, with the, uh, reaching the iliac crust, we have to remove it before uh, transplant. To, yes, uh, uh, our uh, self good, good place yeah. to. Uh, uh, I, sorry, I forgot to mention that reflux part. So usually the reflux, if uh, and you said 20% 20, uh, 20 or so, will have reflux on the other side. Low so usually good. what we do is, when I do the scan, if there is hydronephrosis on the contralateral side, if not the size with the, with the multi-dysplastic kidney, we refer them to do MCG. Of course, we would prophylactic antibiotic before that. But if there is no hydronephrosis, um, we counsel the family that they are at higher risk of UTI. So if there is any sign of UTI, we treat with the prophylactic and then we do MCG. Or as you said, Dr. Amar, we can do it from very beginning. Sure. Thank you very much. That was a brilliant discussion from our experts. Thank you, Dr. Antisal. Thank you, Dr. Amar.